I'm David Pearson from the Contra Costa County Bar Association, and I'm a partner at Brothers Smith. On behalf of the Contra Costa County Bar Association, I would like to thank you for attending the 26th Annual Spectacular and this afternoon's session, COVID Bankruptcy Relief for Small Business Debtors, a review of the Small Business Reorganization Act presented by the CCCBA Business Law and Bankruptcy Sections. I hope you had a chance to visit the networking rooms and our sponsors today. Our event and program sponsors are a very important part of our CCCBA community. They make it possible for us to provide events like this. Please support us by supporting them. Please make sure to join us at 6 p.m. tonight for the entertainment portion of our program. We want to bring a little fun your way this year with a bit of the bard, a bit of laughter, and always some magic. It will be lots of fun. Also, tomorrow we have a great half day planned with two MCLA programs in the morning, our keynote with Congressman Eric Swalwell and our wellness forum in the early afternoon. At this time, I would like to pass the program over to David Arrieta, the chair of our bankruptcy section. Okay, thank you, David. So for today, uh, we have a comprehensive outline that you should have already received. Uh, we also have a short agenda on a PowerPoint, which I'm gonna share right now. You also should have that so you can reference that. And let me share that right now. So today we're, we're going to get a little introduction of the existing chapter 11 process and then compare that to the new uh, SBRA Act and then get into some of the specifics of what actually the act is going over, including um, the roles of a subchapter five trustee, the uh, duties of a debtor in possession, and then talk about the specifics, uh, the new procedural and administrative features of the act, the subchapter five plan, the confirmation process. We'll get into the discharge changes, uh, changes to the property of the estate, and talk about default and remedies after confirmation, the effective dates, some creditor issues, and get a perspective from the bench uh, after the first six months of the act. Okay, now I would like to, uh, introduce the speakers for today. First, we have the Honorable Charles D. Novak, Chief Judge, United States Bankruptcy Court, Northern District of California, Oakland Division. He's been on the bench since May 2010. Next, we have Gina R. Klump. She was recently appointed as a Subchapter 5 Bankruptcy Trustee. She's a certified specialist in bankruptcy law and has a, her own private practice in Petaluma, California. Next, we have Steve Reynolds. He is a practicing attorney in Davis, California. He's been uh, practicing bankruptcy law since 1990 and represents individuals and businesses in all chapters of bankruptcy. And I will note he's a former Chapter 7 trustee. I have a law practice in Walnut Creek. I'm a certified specialist in bankruptcy law, and I've been practicing since 1993. For today combined, we have 93 years of bankruptcy experience on this panel, so it should be a good program. Okay, so let's start with what we have right now under Chapter 11 and then do a quick comparison to the uh, new act. Chapter 11 right now, the problem has been it's very expensive, time consuming, and risky for small businesses. Judge Novak did a, some research uh, in the um, local court. The confirmation rate is only 28%, 27, 28%. And um, many of the cases, after they're filed, they have to um, start paying quarterly fees. There's significant preparation in getting the case filed. After the case is up and running, there's significant attorney's fees and other professionals that have to be paid. And there's a possibility of a creditors committee that has to also be paid for by the debtor. The inherent problem I found is that the debtors left to operate the business and propose a plan and then get it confirmed. There's no chapter 11 trustee that gets appointed. 
It's just the U.S. trustee's office and the court monitoring the progress of the case. A disclosure statement has to be pre presented and approved by the court. Once that's done, a plan of reorganization has to be filed. There has to be voting by the creditors and the debtor needs one class of impaired claims to vote in favor of the plan, which can be hard in a lot of small cases. The problem is a lot of uh, creditors just don't vote and you can't, you can't get enough votes that are needed. In addition, if you have one large creditor, that can really impact the case and not get a plan confirmed. Um, operating companies, they may need time in order to get enough financial results uh, with their monthly operating reports to show that the case is actually even feasible. Uh, the absolute priority rule poses problems for a lot of Chapter 11 debtors, especially for individual debtors filing for relief. So the end result is the confirmation rate is just really low and it's really hard for a lot of small businesses. Uh, in my experience, a lot of businesses, once you run through all these options for Chapter 11, they'll just decide it's cheaper and easier just to go out of business and do something else. So enter the Small Business Reorganization Act. It became effective February 19, 2020. And the key is, is it was enacted to specifically eliminate the hindrances that might deter a small business from reorganizing under Chapter 11. The goal was achieved with a more efficient process for reorganizations and a simpler standard for plan confirmation. The original debt limit was $2,725,625. With the CARES Act that was passed, it's been temporarily increased to $7,500,000. And that's going to be in effect until March 27, 2021. That's going to make it more available for, to a lot of small businesses that could take advantage of the key changes. So what are these key changes? What is this act doing? Well, it's all about, I would say, time and cost. Reduce costs because there's no U.S. trustee quarterly fees. There's no committee creditor committees. A subchapter five trustee is appointed whose role is to help the debtor obtain a confirmed plan. They're gonna act more like a mediator in these cases. There's no absolute priority rule, no disclosure statement. You can even use a, a simpler form plan. The time, train, the time frames for an early status conference apply and there's an early deadline to file a plan. And it can be hard to get those dates extended. As for plan confirmation, a court can now confirm a plan without the acceptance of an impaired class of creditors. So long as the plan does not unfairly discriminate and is fair and equitable in regards to each class of creditor claims. A court can even confirm a plan without any votes or voting. There's differences as to consensual plans versus non-consensual plans with the subchapter five trustee making plan payments, just like a chapter 12 and chapter 13 trustee. The rules for discharge have been changed. It can ha happen earlier if you have a consensual plan. And last, there's a new ability to modify the rights of holders of claims secured by a debtor's principal residence. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Reynolds and he's gonna get into the more of the details of the act. Thank you, David. <clears throat> the debtor decides whether they're going to be in a subchapter five bankruptcy. They generally elect that um, status when they file their case. A subchapter five debtor has to qualify as a small business um, debtor and that they're subject to the debt limits. If they file between now and um, <clears throat> March 27th, 2021, the debt limit is $7,500,000. That goes back down to $2,725,625 <clears throat> on March 27th, and then it doesn't adjust upward again until April 1st, uh, 2022. So if you, unless Congress acts and perhaps extends the deadline, um, we're going to be back to just small businesses. And it's not very hard in uh, the Northern Eastern District of California 
to exceed uh, $2.7 million in debt. Um, so <clears throat> the debt limit's important. There's the, we'll be getting to the, um, what happens if you're in its standard chapter 11 case and you want to elect subchapter five um, status. That's been a hot topic, but I think it's going away because people now have an opportunity to um, file as a subchapter five debtor. And, you know, there was, there was a gap period where people had existing sub -cha um, chapter 11 cases and wanted to elect. That's going away. Um, so as I said, the definition of a small business debtor, somebody with liquidated debts of less than uh, the 2 million seven figure, and that uh, at least 50% of the debt has to arise from commercial or business activities. This, this can be problematic for a sole proprietorship because the largest um, debt most individuals have is their mortgage, and that's normally for household purposes. So that's can be a bar um, coming in for an individual. Um, another exclusion are persons or entities whose primary activity is business owning single asset real estate. Um, so if you've got a special purpose entity that just holds real estate, they're not going not going to qualify as either a small business or a um, subchapter five debtor. And if an individual's business is holding real estate, that's not going to work. Also excluded are corporations subject to reporting under 13 or 15 D of the Security Exchange Act of 1934. That's most publicly traded companies, although there's publicly traded companies that do qualify. Um, that's kind of the, <clears throat> the how you get here. And once you've elected that um, status as a subchapter five trustee, a subchapter, or once you've elected status as a chapter five debtor, you get a subchapter five trustee. And we've got one here, Gina. Thank you, Sue. So the subchapter five trustee, um, what do they do? The subchapter five trustees are, are appointed by the US trustee. We've got four subchapter five trustees in the Northern District. I think there are five or six in the Eastern District. I don't, don't quote me on that. Um, I've seen four so far. Oh, it's four, okay. So it's four in each district. Um, the, the trustees are appointed on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, the U.S. trustee reviews the case and, and kind of looks at the background of the case and decides which trustee they want to appoint for the, for the case. Um, the role of the subchapter 5 trustee is a, similar to a chapter 12 or a chapter 13 trustee, but there's an added specific duty to facilitate confirmation of a consensual chapter 11 plan. While a chapter 13 trustee or a chapter 12 trustee has the duty to advise and assist the debtor in performance under the plan. So the trustee can help as a subchapter five trustee facilitate discussions between the debtor and the creditors, try to, as you said earlier, David, maybe mediate disputes, um, but really try to help the debtor get towards a con consensual plan. Um, the U.S. trustee is still involved in, in some aspects of the case in that they are still conduct the 341 hearing. The, US, the, the Chapter 5 trustee appears at all of those hearings and also has a duty to review all the debtor's background information. Um, the attend the 341 meeting, the status conference, and any hearing related to property of the, of the bankruptcy estate. The debtor does not have to pay US, U.S. quarterly fees, but they do have to pay the subchapter five trustees fees. And the compensation is based on the type of trustee appointed to the case. Um, again, in the Northern District, we have panel trustees. We don't have a standing trustee. If we had a standing trustee, their fees would be similar to a chapter 12 or 13 trustee where it would be a percentage of payments but here it's based under um, section 330 and it's and the trustee has to apply 
for compensation and the court has to approve that. They would be paid, they're then paid under the plan by the debtor's payment, by the debtor's payments or at confirmation if it's a consensual confirmation. The trustee can employ professionals if they need to, um, although since Congress stated the intention of subchapter five is really to try to reduce fees, a, a trustee having to hire an attorney really would increase the fees. So a trustee, I would think, wouldn't really need to hire attorneys unless they replace the debtor as the, as the operator. So the debtor can be taken out of possession. The trustee can actually step into their shoes if for cause. So that's of course similar to a regular chapter 11. Um, but other than that, it's, it's really encouraged and encouraged by the US trustee to try to keep the fees as low as possible so that, this, so that debtors can succeed in these cases. Um, the debtor, the trustee will pay, make the payments under the plan if the plan is confirmed non-consensually. If the plan is confirmed consensually, then the trustee, his, the trustee's um, appointment ends and their services end at, upon substantial consummation of the plan. Let's see what I have to talk about. I think that's all for mine. Oops. I have a question for you, Gina. Yeah. Let's say you have a consensual plan that proposes payments out to time. Is there any prohibition on the subchapter five trustee acting as a dispersing agent? If there's a, con not, if a consensual plan? A consensual plan is confirmed and the plan calls for a stream of payments over time. Is there any reason why the subchapter five trustee couldn't serve as a dispersing agent? I don't think that there is a reason under the code. Judge Novak, you can let me know your opinion. I, I think if it's in the plan, you can you could do that. And the code is very clear that the trustee's duties end upon confirmation of a consensual plan, but it also says unless otherwise ordered. So you know, the, uh, I guess two points. One. It'd be interesting to see if the U.S. trustee takes a takes a position on what its uh, subchapter five trustees can do, can do uh, after he or she is is, is discharged in, in a in a consensual plan. Two, uh, you know, given the size of these cases and and the need, and again, one of the goals is to try and be as cost efficient as possible. I'd be a little concerned about a uh, a small corporation needing a third party to charge them an hourly rate to disperse funds. Uh, I would, I mean, if, if I'm a creditor, uh, again, because creditors, uh, I'd be a bit concerned about that too, because every dollar that flows uh, to Gina uh, is one less dollar that could possibly flow to creditors. So I'd be surprised if a consensual plan would have uh, such a provision. Again, it's, 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 again, it's, it's possible. But I, I think that would be, it, it, it would undermine perhaps one of the main reasons uh, for subchapter five, which is cost, reduced yeah, cost. Yeah. In theory, sure. In practice, I, I would think unlikely. I, I raise it wearing debtor's counsel's hat, and that's another thing the debtor can't mess up. And it may give creditors some. Uh, comfort if they know, let's say there's quarterly disbursements, that they're going to the trustee and maybe they're paying priority claims first or something. But there's oftentimes the general unsecured after confirmation don't hear from the estate for quite some time as other payments are being made. If I were a creditor, I might be happy to know that you know, the payments are being made, they just haven't flown to me. Well, I would say that the creditors relief then in order to get, if they're worried about that, then they can object to confirmation. So it would be a non-consensual confirmation. And, and, and remember, uh, one of the, I think one of the elements of the consensual plan, because they can't be confirmed, or excuse me, they can't be modified post-confirmation, is that the plan has got to provide for an effective means of, uh, it, that the plan has got to provide uh, an effective means to address a breach 
And again, you know, that's something that's unsaid for the, again, in, in non subchapter five cases, but, it, but it's an explicit provision uh, if you want a consensual plan. There has to be a mechanism uh, to address defaults. So, you know, hopefully that will allay some concerns uh, by creditors that, that, they're, that they're, you know, if they're not hearing something, perhaps uh, they need to invoke some provision in the plan which says, gee, you're in default. Great. Okay, Steve, you want to tell us about the uh, duties of a debtor in possession? Yeah, the <clears throat> debtor has all of the duties of a debtor in possession in a non subchapter five um, bankruptcy case. And those, those duties can be significant, especially for an unsophisticated debtor. I mean, if you've got a mom and pop um, business, they may not be doing uh, monthly profit and loss statements. Um, so once you're in chapter 11, the um, debtor, debtor in possession has um, a lot of duties. They're, you know, they have to close their existing bank accounts and open debtor in possession bank accounts. They have to um, provide detailed information to the U.S. trustee um, to complete the initial debtor interview process, and that's a preparation for the um, creditor meeting. Um, so there's a lot of detailed information that the debtors um, going to be providing to the U.S. trustee's office right away. Um, and on, then, on, then once, once you've sort of cleared that obstacle, you're going to be filing monthly operating reports, um, providing them to the U.S. trustee and any creditor who wants them and filing them with the court. That's an ongoing obligation until plan confirmation. And um, it's not unduly burdensome to sophisticated um, debtors, but again, it can be problematic for the mom and pops. Oftentimes, an expense that debtors should anticipate is hiring an accountant to assist them in the monthly, the reporting uh, requirements of the plan. And sometimes that can be useful um, in putting together a plan and making the financial projections necessary to put forward a plan and also to support confirmation of the plan. Um, just like in a standard chapter 11, they're gonna need authority to use cash collateral if any of the accounts are security for a creditor. Um, they may well need authority to pay um, pre-petition wages. Um, in my limited experience with confirming subchapter five plans, about a third of the fees I've seen so far were spent on just debtor in possession compliance. Um, maybe at some point we can come up with a simplified uh, monthly operating report that's less onerous um, for um, debtors, but right now I don't think there's any statutory provision for it. And I don't think anybody has at the US trustee or on the bench has an appetite to reduce those burdens because they rely on those reports to see what's going on. So <clears throat> we'll see whether there's, uh, the US trustee does have a simpler uh, monthly operating report form. We'll see if maybe we get a simpler simple uh, for some of these smaller uh, subchapter five cases. Um, as David mentioned, uh, there's no creditor committee and there's no creditor committee council and there's no creditor committee financial advisors, uh, all of which reduces uh, the costs and risks of um, a subchapter five case. Um, and, you know, Steve, I, you know, excuse me, I always question the selling point uh, on uh, of that, because I've been on the bench for 10 years. Uh, and again, you know, Oakland doesn't get the, uh, both in Oakland and San Jose, and, you know, we typically don't get the largest uh, chapter 11s, but I can count on one hand the number of 
creditors committee creditor committees that uh, uh, that I've had my chapter of the cases. So I know in, in theory it's it's a great selling point, uh, but but you know how many times you see a a creditors committee in these size uh, these size cases? It's rare. Uh, yeah, but it's again it's a risk for the um, debtor. No, it's it's a risk because it, it's it's double it's it's double the fun because you've got. Uh, more attorneys working and, and double the expense. And, and it's um, front and center for me because I've got a subchapter five that was a standard chapter 11 dismissed and then refiled. And we have about $180,000 of unpaid creditor committee and debtor fees from the prior case. So it was, you know, a way to the races. And um, that's, one, that's one way to make friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I've had to explain to them that uh, their mother didn't raise them to be unsecured creditors, and that's what they are now. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, another advantage of subchapter five is that there's no disclosure statement. Um, the, the disclosure, there's still disclosure to creditors. There's a history and sort of a project discussion of the business of the debtor and projections forward. And they're still going to, we're still going to have to convince the judge that our plan is feasible, but we don't have a separate disclosure statement. We provide a lot of the information in the new plan, but there's no separate document called a disclosure statement. And there's no hearing to approve a disclosure statement that saves time and money and court resources. Um, and in my experience, most fights over disclosure statements are really about confirmation and um, an opportunity for everybody to preview their confirmation arguments. Um, so there is disclosure required of the debtor, but it's more in, it's contained in the subchapter um, five plan, which I think we've mentioned has to be filed within 90 days of filing. And it's, and it's a form plan. So you know, debtors also save money because it's, uh, you know, the lawyers don't have to craft their own plan. It's, it's a, it's a, I, I would think, I believe most districts have, have adopted the national form plan. So again, you also save money that way. Is that required in the Northern District? Because in the Eastern District, it's not. No, the Northern, uh, the Northern District has adopted, I believe, I believe the national form plan, uh, which, uh, it, and again, the Northern District, I think is, is, I don't want to, I'll use the word unique, but I may be overstating it. Now we have a form chapter, a, a combined plan disclosure statement of the individuals to use and which I've required, asked corporate chapter of debtors also to use. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very easy document to use that saves money. But, uh, but you, know, so, you know, I haven't done that study uh, again, but we, we've adopted the, the national form plan, which looks, a bit like our combined plan disclosure statement. So if you practice in the Northern District of California, it's a chapter 11 debtor, you know, and you've been using our form, our form combined plan and disclosure statement, you know, the national subchapter five plan is, uh, is, not, uh, is not something from ours. It's something that, that, uh, that looks somewhat familiar. Yeah, I would, I would say both of the, sorry, go ahead, Jim. I would just say, um, both, both the combined plan that I, I've used both of those um, and I've seen the subchapter five plans just recently and they, they, they're I would say they're, they're going to work well because they're they're very streamlined um, I would say to some extent they might be easier than a chapter 13 plan in some cases. The one thing about the one thing about the national plan that people should know um, I don't know if it was drafted quickly but there is an article one of that plan. It states that a disclosure statement has been approved and is being circulated <laughs> along with this plan. So it's just something that I always point out to debtors council because it obviously has to either be removed or crossed out because that's not the case. And I've been surprised that they haven't updated that plan yet, but it, that still right. says that. And, 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 you know, what, and, and even though there's no disclosure statement, you know, the important aspects of disclosure statement, or some of the important aspects of the disclosure statement are incorporated into the form plan, which is the financials, because that's, that's always the key. And, and again, it's my sense 
uh, again, the Northern District of Judge have, have mentioned it, although we've not committed to it, is that we may draft our own subchapter five plan. And uh, it wouldn't shock me if it looks a lot like the combined document that we're, we're currently using. Again, we've, we've not discussed that in any detail. That's just sitting here today. If I had to guess what might happen, uh, I would guess that, that we may develop our own form plan. And speaking as an Eastern District practitioner, I have borrowed the Northern District Small Business Form Plan um, for cases I've filed in the Eastern District. It's, it covers all the bases and it gets where it needs to go in not much time. It's, it's a good document. I, if, if, you did a if you did a form subchapter five plan, I might steal that as well. Well, again, it's, it's, that's, I'm just speaking for me. I've, I mean, I'm not speaking, I don't have my chief judge hat when I say that, but it wouldn't shock me if, if at some point in time we develop our own form plan. Um, once you've elected uh, subchapter five, there's a mandatory status conference and report. Um, what's interesting to me is um, in a regular subchapter um, or in a regular chapter 11 case, there's not a requirement for a status conference, but at least in the Eastern District, every judge uh, requires a status conference. I don't know what- That's just true in the Northern District. Yeah. I, I mean, it makes sense because a judge has to have some kind of a control over their docket and some early um, insight into what sort of resources a case is going to require. Um, it also, you can oftentimes the standard uh, status conference um, raises, directs uh, counsel's uh, attention to problems that might exist in the case or deadlines. Um, <clears throat> the um, What's interesting is the, the new status conference um, report is less detailed than the standard chapter 11 status conference report. Um, but, you know, in most cases, I don't think it's going to make any difference. And most judges are going to um, take the opportunity to, you know, point out concerns and problems. Um, <clears throat> Timeline for filing a plan. Again, a plan has got to be, must be filed within 90 days um, of the filing date. That deadline may be extended for cause shown. Um, what's the language? An extension is attributable to circumstances for which the debtor should not justly be held accountable. Um, I wouldn't count on that. Um, my notes are maximizing the value of your season pass at North Star is not going to be sufficient grounds. I think you should get a plan on file within the 90 days, keeping in mind that you have the opportunity to modify the plan and also keeping in mind the fact that there's no deadline on confirmation. And there may be the filing the plan might be the start of the dialogue with creditors on how can you modify this plan to make it a consensual plan? Um, it, there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in a chapter 11 case. And generally speaking, I like to get in and out as quickly as possible before mischief has a chance to happen. But <clears throat> it seems to me that getting a plan on file within 90 days is is almost always going to be a good idea, even if there's some reason to delay confirmation because you're waiting for something to happen. You can either build that into the plan or uh, modify the plan after you've filed it. Um, <clears throat> and, and in my cases, it's typically the sale of property. Right. Uh, that, and there's no reason why you can't confirm a plan that calls for the sale of the property and and provide what happens if the property doesn't sell within a certain amount of time. That, you know, that's usually the delay uh, between plan filing and confirmation. Uh, they've got a sale, they've got a sale in process, they want it to close, they'll, they'll then know how much money they have and, and how that money's gonna be dispersed. So that's, that's again, in, 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 in uh, my several chapter, sub chapter five cases, so that's been the that's, that's been the, uh, the reason for delay between plan filing and confirmation. 
Steve, what about what about on like a lot of I've, I've had in the past where you have operating businesses, you, you kind of stick them into chapter 11 and then we all kind of like wait a while and see how how it, you know, how it happens, you know, what are they going to, are they running negative? Are they, are they producing some profit or where are they going with it? But now we've got this 90 day window. I would foresee that we're, we're, we're going to have some cases where we got negative monthly operating reports. I mean, do you, do you see it as just be like in the plan, just speculate, oh, we're going to do better. And this is how we're going to do better. Yeah, I think that's what, I think that's what you're going to have to do. Um, on the other hand, perhaps you file an early motion to extend the time to file the plan because you're in a seasonal business and we need to get through the ski season or we need to get through um, Christmas or whatever the um, driver is on that particular business. I mean, there's lots of good reasons to delay um, proposing a plan or confirming a plan, What, but you'd better get your judge to approve that extension, um, you know, and there may be good reasons to do that and the creditors may be behind it. But if, you, if you're if you in a seasonal business or you're waiting for something to happen, you'd better get that motion to extend time filed sooner rather than later. Um, the, um, well, we discussed before that there's no US, <clears throat> trustee fees, on the other hand, you have, um, you're going to be paying the subchapter five trustee, and we really don't have much experience on what those fees are going to be or what's going to be required of the subchapter five trustees. Um, I, what guidance we have is I took a look at the um, US trustees handbook for subchapter fives trustees and they say trustees are encouraged to keep in mind Congress's stated intent that subchapter five cases not be burdened with excessive administrative expenses expenses when planning their work and submitting their fee applications for review and approval by the court. The trustees fee applications are subject to notice and opportunity for objection by the debtor and creditors in the United States trustee also will review them and object to the requested compensation if it is excessive or unreasonable. We'll just have to see how that works out. I anecdotally, I heard about a um, subchapter five case that where the uh, at the creditor meeting, the subchapter five trustee explained what their budget was, and the debtor elected to convert to chapter seven. Um, hopefully, that's rare. On the other hand, the subchapter five trustees got duties, and um, you know they should get paid for their work. And if we have, you know, and <clears throat> may be very difficult if the debtor is relatively unsophisticated and doesn't have good records, the subchapter five trustee is going to have to sort of make a judgment call how much information they need and how much information they can get at an economical level. And the subchapter five trustees aware that people are going to second guess them. It's kind of an awkward dynamic for a subchapter five trustee. What are your thoughts on that, Gina? As far as as far as the debtor backing out because they realize they're going to have to pay a trustee fees, or well, no, maintaining. You know, how do you, how do you time balance? records? She's going to have to make. She's going to have to maintain time records. Keep time. Oh records. yeah, I I I I do maintain very rigorous time records. Um, I have had one case confirmed consensually. My fees were approved. It was a very quick, I mean, I'll just give you as an example because it's a public record. This was a case that went to confirmation very quickly. It was a converted case. It was a prior chapter 11 that got converted. It got confirmed within probably eight weeks of it converting. And I think my fees were $7,000. So. I think all things considered, because the debtor in that case could not, was having problems with one creditor and couldn't qualify under a chapter 11 without having the, the, this one big creditor object on the basis of the absolute priority rule. So if they're faced with the absolute priority rule or paying a trustee some fees and actually the trustee helping you get towards, con get towards confirmation, I, I, to me, it doesn't seem like a big expense, really. 
Right. Uh, the the problem it for the subchapter five trustees knowing when to dig into something and spend a lot of time figuring it out and when mm -hmm. to sit back. And that's just a conflict inherent in that role in my, in my mind. It is. And, you know, it's also because the subchapter five trustee can actually take over for the debtor if the debtor, if there's any indication of fraud or anything like that. So you definitely have that duty to make sure that you, you investigate the debtors as much as you can. Um, so I would say never reduce fees in order to not, not, in, not do your duty to fulfill the, the code section where it says, you know, you need to investigate the debtor. You need to know what's going on. Do they have, because that goes towards feasibility, that goes towards a, a lot of different issues. And, and it's inherent in your job, which perhaps the most important job is to facilitate the consensual plan. If you don't, if you don't understand the debtor and how, and how it's operating, and uh, it's difficult to, it's difficult to be an effective facilitator. Exactly. I, I would think if she, if uh, the, the trustee can just help move it along, that's they're worth the weight in gold because it, otherwise you're you're dealing with the objecting creditor and their counsel, and that's just going to rack up a lot of time and, and, and costs. The trustee can come in and kind of help in the middle of it, move it along. It's, it's all the better. Right. Um, one note I had is that a, a debtor can modify a claim secured by their principal residence. That's a big difference in subchapter sub five, but that debt has to be related to the business, not just simply acquiring the um, property. Um, so it's, it's usually a home equity loan or something like that, or that, would that be right, Steve? Yeah. And if that's the case, then you can modify the claim down to uh, the value. Um, we'll see, we'll have to wait until real estate prices go down again before we test that. Um, right now there's, I can't think of many uh, uh, cases where that's going to uh, be the case. Um, confirmation in a chapter, a subchapter five case is much like uh, confirmation in a standard chapter 11, including um, <clears throat> ballots being um, given to the uh, creditors. And that's where you're going to see whether you have a consensual plan or not, whether you have, you know, all of your accepting classes. Um, I confirmed a non-consensual case and I knew it was going to be a non-consensual case from the get-go because we had a secured creditor class in the form of a Mexican timeshare and I knew we would never hear anything from that creditor and I was right. So by definition we couldn't have a consensual plan although I, but for that one class I think we would have had a consensual plan. It was a pretty simple uh, liquidating case and everybody got paid and we were done. Um, in confirmation, the plan proponent uh, brings a motion to confirm plan, submits evidence, um, goes through the elements of confirmation. Now, um, again, as mentioned before, we don't have an absolute priority rule in um, <clears throat> subchapter five, and that makes a world of difference. And we we don't have to have a consensual plan, so you technically don't have to have any accepting classes. This is a again, the absolute priority, again just and the absolute priority problem can be a big sticking point in in regular chapter eleven because what it means is that if the for example if the unsecured class doesn't accept a plan, the debtor without uh, the debtor cannot retain any of his her its property. And, and that's a so no, so that's a you know one, one of these large sticking points in non subchapter five chapter eleven is correct uh, absolutely and what's worse in an individual case property of the estate includes their post petition earnings right. so um, it, if you've got a hostile unsecured creditor class you can <coughs> you can be absolutely stuck and if you have a 
undersecured creditor who makes the election to be treated as both secured and unsecured, that can easily swamp every other uh, class and, and make a non subchapter five plan simply unconfirmable. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons that subchapter five was created to avoid that problem because I'm sure you'd see perfectly good reorganization cases that just simply couldn't go forward because there was a creditor that wasn't going to consent no, you know, no matter what. Um, the, the, other, the other advantage in small cases is I've seen small, uh, small business chapter 11s not be confirmed or almost not be confirmed because none of the unsecured creditors bother to vote one way or the other. Um, I was always glad when I saw American Express because they typically vote in a small business chapter 11 and um, they don't always vote the way I'd like, but at least they participate. Whereas you'll often see, you know, lots and lots of unsecured creditors that simply don't participate. And then you may not have a, an accepting uh, unsecured class. Um, the <clears throat> acceptance, um, you know, or <clears throat> non-consensual confirmation, the, ex the acceptance has been basically um, replaced with what most folks are calling a best efforts test. And that means that the secured creditors are gonna receive the value or payments representing the value of their collateral. And then it also, the, um, what's available beyond that is called disposable income. And disposable income is everything not reasonably necessary to be expended for maintenance or support of the de debtor or um, dependence of the debtor, uh, domestic support obligation of the debtor that was payable before the date of the um, filing of the petition, payments necessary for the continuation, preservation, or operation of the business of the debtor. Um, most of the small business debtors I've had, they've said, geez, that's what they want. You know, they just want to be able to keep their business going and they're facing unpayable debts. And this provides them a vehicle to take care of the debts and keep the business going. Um, <clears throat> and we don't, in a, in a subchapter five case, we don't have to be concerned with the means test um, required in a chapter 13, which the means test doesn't always make sense. Um, the, a question I have, and we're um, early days on this, is how much cash does a debtor need um, when we're projecting payments out? They obviously need some cash to keep operating. Does that go into the, is the operating capital disposable um, income? Well, the operating capital may very well be, uh, again, be part of the best, you know, again, what, what I call the liquidation analysis. Um, I'm not sure about, again, that's, that's one, of the, one of the points I'm going to make is I, uh, what, one of the terms of, new terms of art is this concept of disposable income in subchapter five. And, and you know, my suggestion to lawyers is uh, be creative as to what disposable, and both on the debtor and creditor side, be creative. Uh, because we don't have appellate decisions to guide us, so you know you can you, you can get to you can zealously argue uh, your, a position uh, because you know, again it's a blank it's a blank slate, uh, and again I would urge lawyers to be creative uh, when they can. So that's good questions, Steve, and, and we'll find it. again. You know, my my gut says well if, if it's you know if it's actual cash in hand, operating capital. Uh, that probably goes to you know the uh, best you know best interest of creditors test. What you know, what I always refer to as you know the chapter seven liquidation analysis. Uh, right. chapter, but uh, again, this is where lawyers get to get to uh, 
use their legal instincts and creativity and make the best argument they can. Oh, the only guidance I've seen is there's some analogies to chapter 12 and they let chapter 12 debtors hold on to a certain amount of capital, which, you know, you need to continue your farming operation. So. And, and, and remember, you know, if we're talking about, again, again, one of the questions about disposable income that, that, that some people have considered is, well, you know, it's, you got to put money, you got, you have to put money back into the business to keep it running. And, and if your financial projections uh, are based upon uh, continued growth, well, you need capital to do it. Uh, so you may, so that, that dollar that could otherwise be, be dis, you know, dispersed uh, either by the debt or the or some chapter five trustee, you know, through a confirmed plan, perhaps it, perhaps it, it should be used as, you know, to help buy new, Buy, you know, buy inventory, you know, obviously buy inventory and new machines so that the company can grow. Uh, so it's, uh, again, that's why you have consensual plans and that's why you have judges who will have to decide, you know, what disposable income is. And sometimes you have creditors who would rather have a customer than the 17 cents on a dollar that a liquidation represents. That's right. That's right. And the minimum time period only has to be for the, the three years, right? Well, I mean, it, not in the consensual plan, is that correct, Gina? I mean, there's no, again, again, that's another one of these uh, phrases that needs to be fleshed out. You know, what exact, you know, a judge can impose a different uh, minimum commitment period, I believe is the phrase. Well, again, this is where lawyers have got to be creative. Uh, Again, it's one of the questions that, that has not been answered. You know, several courts, have, I think several trial level bankruptcy courts have addressed it, but you know, there's no appellate, there's no, you know, there's no appellate guidance. And that's gonna take a while. So it's gonna be, again, for people who've been practicing uh, since 2005 when BAPSIPA came into play, we all know uh, there was a flurry of case law interpreting all the new, all the, you know, all the new BAPSIPA provisions. Uh, to a certain extent, we'll see the same here. And it does only come into play if it's a non-consensual plan. So if you've got a consensual plan, you've made a deal with all the creditors, then you don't even have to worry about that. Correct. Again, and, and, and again, one of the, I, look, all chapter 11s are geared towards uh, or, or in, incentivize uh, debtors and creditors to have a consensual to have a consensual plan but i think the sub i think sub chapter five uh makes makes that point more clear than the non sub chapter five uh chapter 11 provisions let me ask a question and just how they they set that up there's no prohibition against if you did a say a three to up to a five year disposable income payment to your general unsecured class. At the same time, you could also have provisions for other classes, right? Like secure, some other secured classes where you're, you're paying them out over the next 10 or 15 years, right? Yeah, you can, you can have your, just like in a chapter 12, you can have your secured debt paid out, you know, over a greater term than the plan term. Um, one, <clears throat> One big difference between consensual and non-consensual plans, and I'm kind of interested to hear what other people think about it, is in a non-consensual plan, you can modify. And in a consensual plan, there's no modification. And if 2020 has taught us anything, things can change in ways we didn't imagine. Um, and, and well, I mean, it, that's correct. And, you know, the rationale behind that is in a consensual plan, uh, it's consensual. Uh, all the creditors and debtors have agreed to what the plan should be. In a non-consensual plan, uh, certain things have been imposed on the debtor. Uh, again, w uh, which the debtor didn't voluntarily agree to. So that's why they allow a, d a debtor, and remember only, only a debtor can move to modify the plan. No one else can. Uh, why they allow debtors, I, I suspect, to modify post-confirmation non-consensual plans. But, you know, again, this is where creativity comes into play. 
you know, modification says I have to file a motion to modify. Well, what about a plan which has incorporated uh, modified terms based upon the debtor hitting or not hitting certain, you know, certain uh, financial, uh, so, you know, certain uh, you know, financial goals. Uh, so it's, it's again, one, one of those things you have to think about as debtor's counsel, exactly when you're proposing a, a consensual plan, uh, how do I address this inability to modify? And maybe you do it by saying, okay, if I hit this financial benchmark or don't hit this financial benchmark, this will happen. I'm not sure if that's a judge will buy it, but, uh, but again, a modification requires a motion. If there is no motion, if it's built within the chapter 11 plan, you know, who knows? Yeah, I think we're all gonna be thinking hard about in a consensual plan because modification's not available. What if, what if, what if? Right, that's right. Uh, you've got, you know, you've got to look as far down the road as you possibly can. That's what good lawyers do. And then something happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and again, best laid plans. Uh, but that's you know, but that's the best you can do. Well, when I was thinking about that problem, I said, you know, at some point, if you have some true unknown unknown. It may be the debtor and the creditors get together and decide what they want to do. And maybe you dismiss and refile the consensual plan that everybody's agreed to in light of uh, change in circumstances. That's, I, go ahead. I will say in uh, the case that I was talking about earlier that was confirmed consensually, the debtor proposed to increase payments if they were able to increase occupancy of their of their of their business so they proposed and my only issue was how are people going to know if you have increased occupancy and they they came up with a plan for that so in that case they will have a step up in payments if they have more so in that case they're actually helping the creditors but they didn't put themselves in a position where they were stuck with paying more than they could now without knowing if they're gonna, because they have COVID restrictions right now. So in that case, I think it did incentivize the, incentivize the creditors to vote for the plan because they liked that the debtor was gonna offer them more if the debtors was able to increase the occupancy of their homes. That makes a lot of sense, um, especially, you know, in a leasing environment where all we know is it's crummy now. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I had some uh, discharge. Um, upon confirmation of a consensual plan, the debtor receives a discharge. In a non-consensual plan, the discharge isn't entered until the payments are completed. The court retains jurisdiction and, you know, you'll file a motion for discharge once you've completed the payments. And, you know, the ordinary rules of presenting evidence would apply there. Um, <clears throat> there's a change in property of the estate, with, which we've spoken of before in the subchapter 5, 1129A15 doesn't apply at post petition earnings of an individual or not property of the uh, bankruptcy estate. Um, in a non consensual plan, you do have the opportunity to modify the plan. Um, and, you know, in the chapter 12 and 13 context, we see modifications all the time. Um, it's hard to imagine a chapter 12 where a modification for, um, you know, a change in crop prices might, uh, you know, is easily contemplated, how's that? Um, so again, if you're doing a consensual plan, you really need to spend some time considering the what ifs in the fact that you're not gonna have a, uh, a modification available. The debtor in possession can also be, um, well, it can, <clears throat> can always be removed for cause, but it can also um, be removed for 
in fact, the court must remove a debtor in possession for failure to perform under a plan. Um, you know, the, there's, in a consensual plan, the property is gone, but in a non-consensual plan, the property remains property of the estate. And if the debtor in possession is removed, the subchapter five trustee is still there. Now, how does the subchapter five trustee feel about springing to life two and a half years post-confirmation. Part of the job. <laughs> and, and there's no... Um, it hasn't happened yet, Steve. Right. right. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I've seen it in about two and a half years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And, you know, well, now I can't recall. Are, post, are there... Oh, I guess there's quarterly post-confirmation report. So the subchapter five trustee is gonna at least be reviewing those post-confirmation reports. Right. And, so and you have some notion of what's going on. Right. Um, Are those record, uh, reports on a quarterly basis? Yeah, the post -con well, in a regular chapter 11, you've got quarterly post-confirmation reports until the case is closed. And my reading of this is you're going to be stuck with the, in a non-consensual plan, you're going to be have post, uh, post-confirmation quarterly reports. And I guess that's the vehicle that creditors and the subchapter five trustee are able to determine if uh, the plan's being performed. Um, and then we'll also see whether this, if everything really goes into the tank, well, if everything really goes into the tank, the, rather than having the subchapter five trustee go back into possession, it, that might be, the answer might be just conversion to a um, chapter seven or under the right circumstances, uh, dismissal, dismissal. I mean, there may be some event that you know, there's there's a big smoking crater there, and there's nothing to it for a subchapter five trustee to administer or a chapter seven trustee to administer. Um, where are we on the outline, David? Um, I think uh, we're at the point where um, we don't have too much time left, so. Let me just uh, hit really quick some of the creditor rights and then turn it over to Judge Novak on his some experiences for the first six months. Um, for creditors in these bankruptcies, I mean, a lot of the stuff that's out there still exists under the bankruptcy code. It's not like subchapter five eliminated everything. I mean, you could still file proof of claim. You got to ensure that cash collateral is used right. Uh, assumption rejection of leases is still applicable. Um, ensure that debtors are adhering to the terms of a deed of trust. You can still move for relief from stay. You can still file non-dischargeability complaints. But I think what you need to really focus on from a creditor's perspective is um, what we talked about earlier is, is confirmation. You, you should be double checking that um, the, the best interests of creditor rule, chapter seven liquidation test, make sure that the, what the debtor's proposing is correct. Uh, look at feasibility, um, the projections, what the, what the debtor has, uh, the value of property to be distributed over time, make sure that's not less than the projected disposable income, and um, also ensure that the, the plan is providing the appropriate remedies to protect holders of claims in the event of a default. Um, and possibly a, a creditor could also jump on board and seek remove, removal of the debtor for cause including fraud, dishonesty, incompetence, and also if the plan obligations are not performed. Um, so now I'll just turn it over. We have a little bit of time for uh, Judge Novak, if you could just uh, talk briefly about uh, your thoughts on the first six months. Uh, just uh, let me give you some numbers. Uh, since subchapter five went effective in Feb February, uh, again, when I was preparing for this, 28 cases have been, subchapter five cases have been filed in the Northern District. Approximately 800 have been filed across the country. So this is an, a heavily used subchapter. Uh, 
75% of the subchapter five debtors were corporations or LLCs, which significantly exceeds the percentage of, of corporate entities that, are, that file non-subchapter five bankruptcies, uh, again, in the Northern District, in the Northern District. Uh, I want to remind you, know, one of the interesting things will be, in, in, again, in the next six months, is whether Congress uh, allows the CARES Act in increase to the debt ceiling to, uh, to expire, to sunset. Again, uh, Subchapter 5's debt ceiling is, as we mentioned, you know, $2,725,000 and change. Uh, but under the CARES Act, uh, it's $7.5 million until March 27, 2021. And in my review of the cases that have been filed in Northern District, several cases exceeded the 2.725 million deadline. So it'll be interesting to see if Congress uh, takes the hint from someone perhaps and, in, and makes the CARES Act uh, limitation. I mean, the, the CARES Act uh, debt ceiling uh, permanent. Uh, my experience, chapter 11, uh, experience chapter 11 debtors are filing these cases, which is good. But what I am seeing is a chapter 11 debtor, uh, like an experienced chapter 11 debtors council, uh, not closely read subchapter five. Uh, I, again, one of the provisions uh, in subchapter five is that if you're a debtors council, you are still quote unquote disinterested, which means you can actually file the case and get paid. If you're Ill owed less than $10,000 in, in, in pre-petition attorney's fees. And what, I had one law firm say, oh, you know, we reduced our fees, pre-petition fees to $10,000. I had to remind them it's not 10,000, it's $9,999.99. Uh, again, I've also had lawyers, experienced chapter 11 lawyers, try and extend the deadline for filing plans simply by a stipulation with the trustee. And I had to remind them that no, that's not the standard. And if you don't, and again, if it's not timely filed, uh, you may have a problem. So again, I remind, exp uh, all debtors counsel read the code carefully. As I said, there's a form plan uh, and uh, national plan, and it's possible that Northern District of California will adopt its own form subject to five plan. You know, as, as I've mentioned before, it's always good to have a consensual plan, but I think the, uh, the subject to five provisions really make that point very, very clear. Uh, because if you do have a consensual plan, certain good things happen. It's less expensive. Uh, the Gina Clemson world will be discharged upon substantial consummation of a, cons of, of a uh, consensual plan, but they remain in place in a non-consensual plan. And that, that's, that's money out the door to uh, Ms. Clump and her colleagues. Uh, discharge is entered faster. Uh, if it's not consensual, you get your discharge after, after you complete all payments. That could be, again, and an individuals want the discharge as to, corp as, uh, as to non-individuals. And the property of the estate uh, that the debtor has to include in the plan is broader in non-consensual plans. So I think subchapter five really drives home the point that consensual plans are good. Uh, they certainly benefit the debtor. Point out, the, the last point I want to make uh, is just remind them is uh, be creative. Uh, again, there's no appellate case law. Uh, you're making the law. Uh, at the trial level. Uh, so, you know, within the confines of the code, as best you can, be creative, be zealous because you can be. And again, uh, again, in, in the next six months, again, we'll start to see some appellate case law uh, to give us some more guidance and possibly some, some technical tweaks uh, from Congress and a substantive tweak from Congress, perhaps, if they address the, the CARES Act debt ceiling. Okay, um, I wanted to thank all the speakers today, especially Judge Novak for taking the time. And we're gonna open it up now to uh, chat and uh, everyone can submit a question and we'll respond accordingly. Hi, well, actually what we're gonna do now is um, we're gonna have everybody go to a live Q&A. So um, let me introduce myself. I'm Ann Wolf from the Contra Costa County Bar Association. I'm the Education Events Director and I just want to thank everybody uh, for participating today. And uh, you guys, your 93 years of experience has been fabulous. And uh, thank you for sharing your uh, timely information here with us. Um, so 
Like I said, you're now in, invited to join a live Q&A session with the presenters, which will be immediately following um, my announcements. And below the screen that you're currently watching this on is a link that will take you directly to this session's live Q&A. Um, as David explained, your materials and also your evaluation forms for this program can be downloaded from this session page. Just go to the files tab, which is above the chat. Um, completed evaluation forms it would be great if you just sent them directly to me. Your attendance certificates will be available soon. <clears throat> and if you are a CCCB member, your attendance certificate will be on our website in your member profile. If you are a non-member or would like more information on how to get your attendance certificate, uh, see, uh, see the FAQ tab. <clears throat> so tonight at around six o'clock, we're going to try to have some fun. We have Arthur Goss, who's a longtime San Francisco comic comedian, who also happens to be an attorney. Yes, he does. He's funny, though. Um, Cal Shakes will be with us with some scenes from three great plays. We're in the Lawyers are featured. It should be, that should also be very interesting. Um, and tomorrow, um, we have some great additional MCLEs for you in the morning. We have Eric Swalwell, uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell, as our luncheon keynote speaker. And in the afternoon, uh, we'll hope you will attend our wellness forum. Sarah Tetlow of Firm Focus and Gina Cho will be providing some uh, how to survive the uh, remote environment that we are living, working, and learning in. And uh, then we'll end up with 20 minutes of mindfulness meditation to take us into our weekend and into Thanksgiving week. So what I'd like to do is now have you click on the link below to join the live Q&A session with Judge Novak, Gina Klump, Stephen Reynolds, and David Arietta. Thank you all very much, and I'll see you in the live Q&A.